The Taoist sages taught that we should be empty within, empty like a valley. They said that hidden inside that point of emptiness is a spiritual energy. What did they mean by emptiness? And what is that point of spiritual energy they were seeking? These are the mysteries unveiled by the 6th century BC Chinese sage Lao Tzu in his classic, The Tao De Jing. The concept of emptiness, also referred to as non-being, is found in chapter 40 of the Tao De Jing. Here we read, the things of the world originate in being and being originates in non-being. In my last lecture, I explained that non-being is a word Lao Tzu uses to describe that which is nameless, imperceptible, and indescribable. Nameless, imperceptible, and indescribable. It is so absolutely transcendent that he cannot find words to describe it. What Lao Tzu calls non-being or emptiness is in reality the great Tao. The Tao is the all-pervading principle of the universe, the first cause, the absolute. The Tao gives birth to all things, sustains all things. It is that to which all things return it is mysterious and unfathomable. Yet as one Taoist sage put it, the Tao is closer to you than the nose on your face. The one impossible thing is to get a finger's breadth away from it. The significance of non-being or emptiness is brought home in chapter 11 of the Tao De Jing. Lao Tzu says, the 30 spokes unite in the one nave or hub, but it is on the empty space for the axle that the use of the wheel depends. Clay is fashioned into vessels, but it is on their empty hollowness that their use depends. The door and windows are cut out from the walls to form an apartment, but it is on the empty space within that its use depends. Therefore, just as we take advantage of what is, we should recognize the usefulness of what is not. The usefulness of what is not is the usefulness of emptiness or non-being. Max Kaltenmark explains that non-being is efficacious because like a wheel hub, a vessel or a house, it is a receptacle. The image of the 30 spokes converging toward the empty space of the hub is often used to symbolize the virtue of the ruler who attracts all creatures to his service. The virtue of sovereign unity that brings order to the multiplicity of things around it. But the image can also refer to the being of the Taoist who, when empty, that is purified of all passion and desire is fully inhabited by the Tao or, as He Shang Geng puts it, by the vital spirits that animate the body. He Shang Geng says, in the void between heaven and earth, the harmonious breath and equal mixture of yin and yang circulates freely and the 10,000 things are born of themselves. Thus, when man is able to rid himself of his passions, to give up pleasure, and to purify his viscera, that is, the internal organs of the body, then the spirits and souls from heaven and earth can dwell peacefully within him. Along the same lines, Anna Seidel says, Taoism teaches that emptiness realized in the mind of the Taoist who has freed himself 
from all obstructing notions and distracting passions makes the Tao act through him without obstacle. Wrong desires are obstacles to the process of self-emptying that is so necessary to our oneness with God. This theme runs through the writings of the mystics of East and West. The great Hindu epic, the Mahabharat, the warrior Arjuna, asks Lord Krishna, who impels a man to commit sin, even though he be unwilling, as if he were constrained by force? Later, Paul posed the same dilemma. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. And now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. The law of sin is man-made. It is self-created. It is the law by which man has bound himself to his inordinate desires. The law is reinforced by repetitive desire and the repetitive actions that fulfill our repetitive desires. This law of sin is binding upon a man because he has invested so much of himself in his desires and their fulfillment. If we are slaves and we are prisoners, It is by this process alone, not by karma, but by the pursuit of desires and their fulfillment by which we make karma. Lord Krishna tells his disciple Arjuna what it is that impels a man to commit sin and thereby break the laws of God. He says it is desire, it is anger born of passion, It is all-consuming. It violates the laws of God. He tells him, know this. In this world, desire is your principal enemy. Self-knowledge in God is obliterated by this ever-present enemy of the wise. Insatiable desire is like a fire. The senses, the mind, and the understanding are said to be the abode of desire. Through these faculties, desire eludes the embodied self, obliterating his self-knowledge in God. Therefore, restrain the senses, cast off this wicked thing, for desire destroys self-knowledge in God, which is derived from meditation and instruction. Lord Gautama Buddha taught that inordinate desire is the cause of all human suffering. Lord Gautama revealed this precept when he delivered the Four Noble Truths in his first sermon following his enlightenment. The Four Noble Truths are, first, that life is dukkha or suffering. Two, that the cause of this suffering is tanha, tanha, which is desire or craving. Three, that suffering will cease when the craving that causes it is forsaken and overcome. We must forsake it, then we must wage war against it and overcome it, lest it overcome us. He taught that liberation through the cessation of suffering leads to nirvana, which means literally extinction or blowing out, the blowing out of the not-self. The fourth noble truth is that the way to liberation is through living the noble eightfold path or the middle path. The eightfold path consists 
of the following attitudes of righteousness. You know that Jeremiah anticipated the coming of the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness is depicted on the chart of the presence as the middle figure in the chart, the mediator, the teacher, and the real self. This middle figure in the chart is the child of the great Tao, the child of the one who comes forth. And therefore, we call that one the only begotten Son. And that universal Christ is that personhood of each one of us, that individualization of the Christ in Jesus and in all of us is still that one Son, that only begotten Son. Therefore, the Lord, our righteousness, whom we see as this middle figure, teaches us the right way the right way, step by step, of the Eightfold Path. The teaching on the Eightfold Path is commonly ascribed to Gautama Buddha. In truth, it is the teaching of all of the gurus who preceded him in the lineage of Sanat Kumara and all who followed him. It is also the teaching of Jesus Christ. Each one of these steps we can also find in the Christian teaching. So the first step on the Eightfold Path is to have right understanding or right views. The second is right aspiration, right thought or right resolve. Then there is right speech. Fourth is right action or right conduct. Fifth is right livelihood. Sixth is right effort. Seven is right mindfulness and eight is right concentration or right absorption. These eight points of self-mastery are the endowment of your Holy Christ Self. Know this Holy Christ Self as your real self. And know your real self as possessing all of these attributes. Know that your real self has developed them to the full level of Christ ma mastery and adeptship and is waiting for you to receive them. As you and I put on these attributes in daily striving and attentiveness to the precepts of the law, we are putting on the robes of righteousness of our true self. We are putting on our deathless solar body, which Jesus referred to as the wedding garment. We weave this wedding garment by the practice of these eight right attitudes. Your soul is preparing herself to be the bride of the bridegroom. The bridegroom, in Christian terms, is Jesus Christ. Jesus is one with your Holy Christ self, the middle figure in the chart, who is the child of the Tao. These eight points of the law fulfill the seven rays of the seven chakras and the eighth ray and chakra, which is the secret chamber of the heart. It is an antechamber of the heart chakra. This eight petal chakra is the place of the threefold flame. It is the place where you meet the master, the guru, the Lord Buddha, in the secret chamber of the heart. I would like to elaborate further on the first noble truth, that life is duk. Duk is spelled D-U-K-K-H-A. Duk can be translated as suffering, pain, sorrow, discontent, imperfection, sin, or evil. All you have to remember is that duk is an out of alignment state. It's a state you get into when you're out of line with the law of God, out of alignment with his will, his love, his wisdom, and what is just plain right. Houston Smith points out that in the Pali language, the word duk is used to refer to an axle which is off center with respect to its wheel, also to a bone which has slipped out of its socket. 
In both cases, the picture is clear. To get the exact meaning of the first noble truth, that life is suffering, we should read it as follows. Life, in the condition it has gotten itself into, is dislocated. Something has gone wrong. It has slipped out of joint. Gautama said that tanha, which is spelled T-A-N-H-A, tanha, desire or craving, causes suffering. Tanha can also be translated as thirst. Thirsting after something that we do not have makes us suffer. But Gautama does not denounce all forms of desire. Tanha must be understood as craving in the sense of inordinate or wrong desire, self-centered desire, selfishness. It is the drive for private fulfillment or the craving for finite existence, pleasure, and success. Eminent Buddhist author Christmas Humphreys says, Desire means those inclinations which tend to continue or increase separateness, the separate existence of the subject of desire. Life being one, all that tends to separate one aspect from another must needs cause suffering to the unit which even unconsciously works against the law. Man's duty to his brothers is to understand them as extensions, other aspects of himself, as being fellow facets of the same reality. It is therefore not desire itself which is the cause of suffering, but wrong desire because it is personal desire, and it does not take into account the needs of the whole. Edmund Holmes writes, it is the desire for what belongs to the unreal self that generates suffering, for it is impermanent, changeable, perishable. It causes disappointment, disillusionment, and other forms of suffering to him who desires. Desire in itself is not evil. It is desire to affirm the lower self, to live in it, to cling to it, identify oneself with it instead of with the universal self that is evil. As soon as you identify with the lesser self instead of the, gra instead of the greater self, you are outside of the circle of the greater self. You are hanging there suspended and no longer a part of the whole. Buddhist texts record these teachings of Gautama Buddha on the subject of wrong desire. There is in taking things a thirst, a clinging, a grasping. You must lose it. You must lose it altogether, above, below, around, and within. It makes no difference what it is you are grasping at. When a man grasps, Mara, who is the devil, stands beside him. Therefore, the monk, realizing this, should not grasp at anything. He should see the beings that are creatures of attachment as tied to the power of death. The power of death is attachment, our attachment to the body. The person who is searching for his own happiness should pull out the dart that he has stuck in himself, the arrowhead of grieving, of desiring, of despair. Have you ever thought that grieving is desire? Not only grieving the loss of a loved one, desiring that loved one back, but grieving that you do not have something that you want, grieving that you do not have what your neighbor has. This causes grief. And grief acknowledges that there is a finite life of beginning and ending. Grief is a state of mortal consciousness. Grieving, desiring, and despair. Despairing is the sense that you don't have what you need, and you are not who you really are. Despair is a denial of God and does betray our absence of right mindfulness. The man who has taken out the dart, who has no clinging, who has obtained peace of mind, 
Past beyond all grief, this man, free from grief, is still. Still. Oh, the great stillness that comes upon us when our daily tasks are finally through and we are alone. We are alone to be still in God and to take our leave of this body, to journey in octaves of light, to perform, to perform other services, to study in great wisdom schools in other octaves. That moment of stillness when the day has room for no further responsibility or task, and we know that moment of stillness, and all it takes is the moment, and the soul enters into God and is able to have a respite from the responsibilities of the world. This is great joy. But if we have clinging, if we have not taken out the dart, if we still have grief, and no peace of mind, then there will be no stillness, the stillness that the heart needs at the end of each day, an interval of rest. It is a great moment when we come to that place, and it is the point where we take off for the next day and the next round of service. When a person has assessed the world from top to bottom, when there is nothing in the world that raises even a flicker of agitation, then he has become a person free from the smoke fumes, free from the smoke fumes, the tremblings, and the hunger of desire. He has become calm. He has gone beyond getting old. He has gone beyond being born. This means by freeing himself from desire, he has become immortal. He no longer has to reincarnate. Buddhists teach that excessive and inordinate desires and passions are the very thing that causes people to reincarnate again and again. For until they are free from desire, they cannot be free from the wheel of rebirth. The soul reincarnates to fulfill unfulfilled desires of past lives. That is why each and every one of us is here today. They may be good desires or bad desires, but the desire to fulfill them and fulfill them in this plane has brought us here. Until she has no more inordinate desires and no longing to fulfill them, she is earthbound, bound to the plane of her desirings, the place where you have the desire and seek to fulfill it is the place you will return to unless you achieve resolution. Since inordinate desire by definition is a violation of God's laws, then it follows that the fulfillment of such desires is the action or act that precipitates negative karma. Therefore, in addition to being desire-free, in order for a soul to break the wheel of rebirth, she must also atone for the sins she has committed out of or based on her inordinate desires. Thus she returns to the scene of her desires. One, to quench her desires. And two, to balance the negative karma she has made in acting out her desires. A Tibetan Buddhist text warns us, if we do not give up the desires of this life now, we will come under the influence of attachment again in future lifetimes. Gautama Buddha said, when a person fails to perceive the calamities due to sensual gratification and its fruition, and being under the impression that sensuality is happiness, lives enthralled by his passions, he then begins to perform demeritorious karma, demeritorious karma, just as a child will play with filth or one who wishes to die will eat poison. When a man walks hand in hand with a thirst of craving, he will wander from birth to birth, now here, now there, and with never an end in sight. The impulse, I want, 
and the impulse, I have, lose them. That is where most people get stuck. It is wonderful to hear the words of Lord Gautama. He sounds like a man of our time who could step forth on the platform and deliver this lecture himself. To think that he lived 2,500 years ago and to think what a short time is 2,500 years when we ourselves might have been present when he gave his first sermon after discovering the Four Noble Truths and attaining nirvana. And so he admonishes us in the practicalities of daily life and brings home to us advice for living and achieving true soul liberation, true soul liberation in our own time, in our own place. This is the greatness of the minds of all ages that they're teaching is so down to earth and practical to us in our time. I think about what he is saying, and I think about the fact that we think that we're leading a good life, that we're earning our way back to the kingdom of God. But the question is, do we have desires to possess people, to, be, to possess money, to possess things, to possess ourselves, or to experience this and that. The desire for possession is the desire for control, and it is born out of the ignorance that God has the ownership of all things. We do not need to be the caretakers of other people, or money or things, or ourselves. Our desires may not even be inordinate desires, but if any desire becomes an all-consuming passion, an obsession, then we are in trouble. And we need to know it. Some people do not know that they have obsessions. I pointed out to someone some time ago, this thing in your life, this desire has become an obsession. She did not know it. She said, is that true? I said, yes, that is true. Performing a good or bad deed is usually black and white. We make good karma, we make bad karma. We make good karma, we make bad karma. But desiring can be a gray area because people say to themselves, I should be able to have this. I should be able to have that. It's normal. It's the standard of living. If I want to do this, I should be able to do it. What it all comes down to is the first commandment. Desiring anything before God is idolatry, idolatry of ourselves. God wants us to be happy, but he expects us to subordinate our happiness to him. Thou shalt have no other gods before me is put in perspective when we say, Thou shalt have no other desires before me. That means no desiring that is greater than our desiring for God. So we establish a hierarchy of our desires. God is the first thing we think about when we awaken in the morning, the last thing we think about at night, and we think about him all through the day. And our desire is union with him and to be his hands and feet and his instrument. And when we desire this, he will give us all things to accomplish the full and true desiring of himself. Not being able to let go of a desire means that it's more than a passing thing. It's an attachment. The word attachment is key here because through our attachments to people, places, conditions, and things, we get attached to this plane of existence and its doings. And therefore, our souls reincarnate again and again, pulled by our desires to the scene of our unfulfilled desires. 
If you really want to know the truth, our desires lead us around by our noses. So repaying negative karma is not the only requirement of attaining union with God and being free from the round of rebirth. Transmuting the fire of inordinate desire by the sacred fire of God is fundamental to our soul liberation. Every single point of inordinate desire that we are freed from is an increment of our soul's liberation. I can witness to you that in my own life, as I've seen desires for the things of this world drop from me, almost scarcely without my notice, I have correspondingly experienced such a great freedom, such a great soul liberation, that there was nothing that I needed, that all of it was inside of me. It is such a state of peace to not be in a state of want. Wanting something means we are saying, I lack this. I am incomplete without it. What we are really wanting is God. As we are wanting in God, therefore we must desire God. And if we do so with single-minded purpose, we will find that God gives us all of himself, and we will find a new life on planet Earth without having to change garments or change bodies, right in this heart of flesh and this physical temple and with this mind, we can know a freedom we have not known in centuries. And the key here is to know that we do not have to be attached because God supplies us with everything we need. All desires, good or bad, propel our souls back into embodiment. Desire also determines what happens to you and me between embodiments. When the soul takes leave of the physical body and plane, she is assigned to a place commensurate in vibration to her earthly state and karmic level. Although we would all like to go to a retreat of an ascended master on the etheric plane, there are entrance requirements. But souls who have leftover desires may be assigned between embodiments to a place called Devachan. Devachan is a realm where the soul experiences unfulfilled desires. It is in the lower etheric octave. The Devachan is like a dream world, but to the soul it appears absolutely real and concrete. In the book I've been teaching you from at Summit University, A Dweller on Two Planets by Philos the Tibetan, Philos gives an example of a man named Merton Fowler who had been a frustrated inventor in a previous lifetime. Consequently, Fowler's Devachan was a mechanical paradise where many people enjoyed his inventions and where he was a benevolent ruler. While on earth he had desired to correct abuses in the financial system. In his Devachan, he designed and minted coins that were distributed free to the people. The coins even had his own face engraved on them. Around the edge they bore the inscription, Merton Fowler, the people's friend. <laughs> After a soul has spent years or centuries in Devachan fulfilling her desires, she may be free enough to come into embodiment with those desires at least partially fulfilled. Based on the desires and attachments she has resolved and worked through, she is liberated to enter a mission of greater self-giving and self-sacrifice, thereby earning meritorious karma toward her complete liberation. Devachan exists because people need it. It is therapeutic, but it can also be a big waste of time you may be missing your century and your moment on stage. The point is that here or hereafter, the soul must resolve her psychology. She cannot go forward in the cosmic scheme of things until she deals with the unresolved issues and desires of her past lives. It is better then for us to grapple with our psychology, deal with it now, Invoke the violet flame that you see surrounding 
the lower figure in the chart which represents yourself. Invoke that flame of the Holy Spirit and know that it can transmute the cause and core of desires you are not even aware of, recorded in the unconscious and the subconscious mind. To deal with desires today means a liberated existence tomorrow. And that tomorrow might very well be in 24 hours of physical earth time, right here in embodiment. You know, I see people in embodiment today who are living in a dream world. Instead of waiting for their devachans till the conclusion of this life, they take them now. And when they take them now, living in delusions and dreams day after day, then they're not locked into balancing karma, which is the reason for physical embodiment and existence. So can you imagine passing many, many lifetimes just wandering around, skipping here and skipping there and enjoying oneself and coming to the place where at the conclusion of a life, no good karma is made, no bad karma is balanced. That's an amazing imprisonment and a going nowhere. It is truly the out of alignment state. Gautama told a story that I'd like to tell you now. He told it to show how desires bring sorrow. It's about a hawk that seized a piece of meat in a butcher's shop and darted up into the air. The other birds surrounded him and struck at him with feet, claws, and beaks. Unable to bear the pain, he dropped the piece of meat. Another bird seized it. It too, in like manner, being hard-pressed, let the meat fall. Then another bird pounced on it, and another, and whosoever got the meat was pursued by the rest, and whosoever left it go was left in peace. Gautama, on seeing this thought, these desires of ours are like pieces of meat. To those that grasp at them is sorrow, and to those that let them go is peace. And he said, while the hawk had aught to eat, birds of prey pecked at him sore. When perforce he dropped the meat, then they pecked at him no more. In chapter 46 of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu says that true contentment comes from vanquishing inordinate desire. He says, of crimes, none is greater than having things that one desires. Of disasters, None is greater than not knowing when one has enough. Of defects, none brings more sorrow than the desire to attain. Therefore, the contentment one has when he knows that he has enough is abiding contentment indeed. The Masters of Huai Nan, a Taoist collection of sayings on civilization, culture, and government, composed over 2,000 years ago, gives this insight into the enemy of desire. Habitual desires deplete people's energy. Habitual desires deplete people's energy. Likes and dislikes strain people's minds. How many of you are aware how much energy it takes to sustain a desire day after day? A lot of energy goes out of your chakras to sustain a desire. That energy that you have invested in your desires is therefore not there for the healing of your body, for the reversing of old age, disease, and death. Withdraw that energy from your desires. Give it back to your body, and your body will be restored. Likes and dislikes strain people's minds. We have to keep rehearsing in our minds. I dislike that person. I'm supposed to dislike him. And we think about it over and over and reinforce it like a mental mantra. And we don't even notice that we're doing this. We reinforce our opinions of people. And our human likes, we reinforce just as much. And so there, there is another way that we spend energy. Look at the crystal core that descends from the I am presence and the great spheres within spheres that we call the great Tao. That crystal cord is the lifeline to your presence. It goes from the great central sun, the spiritual sun behind the physical sun of all cosmos. 
It begins at that point of center, like an umbilical cord. It descends through your mighty I am presence, through the heart of your holy Christ self, passes through the crown chakra, and comes to rest in the heart. And the heart is the distribution point for this energy in the physical body. This energy feeds the unfed flame. The threefold flame in your heart is fed by that spiritual energy. We have an allotment each day. What can come through that diameter of that crystal cord? The crystal cord was reduced. It is written in scripture that the lifetime was reduced to three score and ten after the flood of Noah. Before that time, there is a recording in the Old Testament that people to live to be 800, 900 years old. Scientists cannot fathom this, but the reason it was actually true is because they had a wider diameter to the crystal cord. More energy, light, and consciousness flowed from God, and therefore they had more years. But they also had more years to do evil and to work the works of evil. So God said, it repenteth me of the creation that I have made. So he shortened the lifespan to reduce our karma-making capacity and therefore ensure that we would have greater opportunity in the future to balance karma and to return and start again. So today the crystal cord is a very thin cord and the threefold flame was also reduced at that time. So God decided to keep us out of mischief by not giving us so much energy, just like wise parents reduce our allowance when they see we are squandering our funds and not managing them well. And so today we have just so much energy. We get up in the morning. Some of us feel energetic from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep again. And others do not even have that much energy. So I'm telling you where your energy goes. It goes where your attention goes. It goes where your desires go. And it goes where the thoughts of your mind and the feelings and the desires are taking up that energy and using it to sustain a personal sense of incompleteness and a self outside of God. So we run down the batteries of the physical body because we do not depend on the source. And we don't depend on the source because we don't identify ourselves with the source and being whole and one in that source. So we live outside of the source and we don't have enough energy translated into money, translated into health, translated into strength of body and mind to accomplish our daily tasks. And so the more we spend energy on our desires, the less energy we have, the less energy we have, the worse we feel until we become all tied up in ourselves, trying to deal with ourselves, heal ourselves, and we grasp at money and we grasp at this and we grasp at that because we have less and less because we are spending more and more of that energy, investing it in this human limitation of thought and feeling. Habitual desires deplete people's energy. Likes and dislikes strain people's minds. If you don't get rid of them quickly, your will and energy will diminish day by day. If you don't get rid of them quickly, your will and energy will diminish day by day. That is the state the entire human race is in today. We are all supposedly diminishing day by day as old age overtakes us and as the diseases of the flesh come to light as the years pass. We are here because we have determined to reverse the spiral. No greater teaching than those given to us by Lord Gautama, Lord Jesus Christ, Lao Tzu, and others. Could we have for understanding the reversing of this process? The masters of Huainan also teaches that all consuming passion or desire is blinding. There is no question about that. Look at a person in a fit of rage or anger. They have lost all reason. They are blinded and they commit acts that violate the laws of God and bind them to a negative karma. 
This work says, the reversal of benefit and harm, the connection between calamity and disaster, should be closely examined. Sometimes when you want something, that in itself can make you lose it. How many have ever had that experience? I've had that experience for sure. And sometimes when you try to avoid something, that in itself can make you face it. Who's had that experience? I have. <laughs> Once a man took a ride in a boat and encountered a squall. Fearful of the waves, he threw himself into the water. <laughs> it was not that he didn't want to live or did not fear to die, but that he was so confused by his fear of death that instead he forgot about life. Are you so afraid of death that you forget about life? Think about that. It is life we should be clinging to. But when we fear something, we hang on to it like a drowning man. The thing we fear most does come upon us, as Job said. The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. You always attract what you fear, Fear is the most base of human emotions. Look at what is in your life and ask, what are the fears within you that has brought this to yourself? In the first place, your real self, your Holy Christ self, is determined that you will conquer fear, and the only way you conquer it is to be faced with it. The Masters of Huai Nan continues, so it is with habitual desires. Once when a man stole some gold right in the middle of a bustling town, the police asked him why he took the gold right there in the open market in broad daylight with so many people around. He said, I only saw the gold, I didn't see the people. <laughs> His heart was so set on what he wanted that he was oblivious to what he was doing. You know, I just saw a special on TV about bank robbers. And it was showing bank robbers who rob banks basically to get drug money. They rob in broad daylight. 85% of them are caught. They do the strangest things. One robber went into a bank, filled out an application form for an account, gave his true name and address of where he actually lived, and then robbed the bank <laughs> and was subsequently caught at his home address. In each and, and every one of these films of people robbing banks, it showed that people were absolutely oblivious to the danger of getting caught because they had such an intense and all-consuming desire for drugs. They had to have drugs and they had to have the money to get the drugs now. So they went and they robbed a bank. So it's amazing how this ancient teaching can be so seen in our society today. Lao Tzu says that desires make us oblivious to the secret essences of the great Tao. Desires pull us down to the plane of desire and the collective consciousness of desire of the whole planet. When we are in a state of desire, we are one with everybody else's desires, not just our own. Because like attracts like. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. The secret essences of the great Tao. What are these essences? They are the essences of the chakras. They are the essence of the sacred fire of the heart. The essence of the light flowing delicately over the crystal cord. The essences of alpha and omega entering the spine and abiding there and actually coming to live in your temple. The secret essences of the great Tao. These are spiritual essences that correspond to the seven chakras of being that denote the seven planes of being, the secret essences that pertain to the life and the consciousness of the soul. Just as we have fluids in the body and blood and such a complex, wondrous mystery of life that God has provided in the physical body, so there are essences to the spiritual body and we are oblivious to them when we are consumed by our desires. When we want something, we are admitting that we have no awareness, that we live and move and have our being in God, and we actually have everything. 
Desire then becomes temptation, and it will unseat you from your moorings on the spiritual path. In chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu writes, truly, only he that rids himself forever of desire can see the secret essences, can see the secret essences. Those constantly with desires by this means will see only that which they yearn for and seek. Those constantly with desires by this means will see only that which they yearn for and seek. Is it not true when you want something, you see it before you? And there's, a, there's a, certainly a law of precipitation whereby what we visualize we bring to us. God allows us to have desires and allows us to observe the results of receiving those desires as a means of liberating us from those desires. Because when we want something and we get it, somehow it neutralizes that desire. And God is always hoping that if we get enough things and everything else that we want, we will finally see the futility of this road and desire him only because with all of the things of this world, we will not have God. The frustration and anxiety that comes from inordinate desire is a topic of Thomas Akempis. He gives Christ's instruction on the necessity for the disciple to empty himself of all wrong desire. My son, thou oughtest to give all for all and to be nothing of thyself. Know that the love of thyself doth thee more hurt than anything in the whole world. According to the love and affection which thou bearest toward anything, so doth it more or less cleave to thee. If thy love be pure, simple, and well-ordered, thou shalt be free from the bondage of things. Do not covet that which it is not lawful to have. Do not have that which may entangle thee and deprive thee of inward liberty. Why art thou consumed with vain grief? Why weary thyself with superfluous cares? Be resigned to my good pleasure, and thou shalt suffer no loss. If thou seek this or that, and wouldst be in such or such a place, the better to enjoy thine own profit and pleasure, Thou shalt never be at quiet, nor free from anxiety. For in every instance, somewhat will be found wanting, and in every place there will be someone to cross thee. He that attributeth any good unto himself hindereth God's grace from coming unto him, because the grace of the Holy Spirit ever seeketh an humble heart. If thou couldst but perfectly bring thyself to nothing and empty thyself of all created love, then ought I with great grace to overflow into thee. To overflow into thee. As Lao Tzu says, humble station is the basis of honor. The low is the foundation of the high. Remember the words of Liu Ming. If people can be empty within, this is the valley. Within emptiness, there is a point of spiritual energy hidden inside. 